<laughs> All right. Uh, I was messing with the lights. Anyway, uh, here we are. It's a nice rainy day, so I figured I might as well get another lecture in before the end of the week and maybe try to get a little bit ahead of the game. So, uh, so here we are. What we want to talk about is the progressive presidents and national progressivism. So last uh, last lecture we talked about the progressive movement and how the progressive movement uh, developed uh, and who was involved in the progressive movement and uh, and what their goals were and what their commonalities and their sources were. It was a fa fairly lengthy uh, <laughs> video. My bad. It happens. Uh, but anyway, so so we're going to talk about now, um, what we talked about last time is we talked about how these uh, these progressive movements made very significant uh, state level and local level uh, reforms. But what about the national level? How did they uh, they appear on the national stage? And as we know, the populists had a, a little bit of success in the uh, in the national stage, but, but uh, unfortunately for the populists, getting involved in the national stage actually ultimately meant the dissolution of their party. So what happened with regard to the, uh, to the progressives and how were things different for the progressives? So um, let's just jump right into it with nothing further ado. So what we're going to do today uh, is we are going to analyze the influence of the progressive movement on national politics. And it is going to be absolutely huge. And it is largely going to be uh, huge because of the pressure. Um, that that uh, po uh, progressives are going to be able to put on presidential politics and presidential presidential electoral politics, and quite frankly, some of it had to do with luck as well. So, um, so moving along uh, now, during the uh, early twentieth century. Um, there were quite a few of these progressive groups. It's very difficult to talk about a single uh, progressive movement. It's, it's much better and m probably much more accurate to refer to progressive movements with an S. Uh, because there were many of them, all right? So it's just some of these movements, uh, of course, uh, among the biggest uh, of these uh, movements was the, uh, the unions, uh, the labor movements, but also the farmers were still invested in the progressive movement. Socialists uh, were becoming a very, very powerful force in the progressive movement, a very powerful national force in the progressive movement, which, as we talked about last, uh, last uh, class, um, was kind of a reason why maybe some of the, some of the more moderate progressives were getting uh, more of a voice because of fear that the socialists, the more radical progressives, uh, would, uh, would take over the debate. Uh, the temperance movement, uh, and in fact, women's movements in general, and the temperance movement was not exclusively a women's movement, but was somewhat of a, uh, was largely led by women. Um, but the uh, women's suffrage movement, civil rights, the civil rights movements uh, that were involved, and we know that there's some, uh, there was some debate among those. And they were also part of this progressive movement and the new progressives. Um, so we, we can kind of see we have quite a few. Uh, child labor and child safety, the settlement houses, uh, and uh, dealing with immigration. So these were all progressive movements, and as you can see, uh, not all of these movements necessarily have the same goal and the same out uh, desired outcome, but all of them had a, a national um, a national imprint. They all were effective not just at, a, at small local levels, but also at a national level. And this was very, very important. And uh, because, especially, remember, one of the, probably one of the pillars of the progressive movement was curtailing economic injustice, and in essence, to curtail the power of the trusts. Um, and so many of the, um, the issues that progressives wanted to deal with needed to have a national um, a national platform because take for example the uh, take the example of the of the trust uh, it, very often in the late nineteenth century um, the uh, attempts to regulate the trust at the state level were being shot down by the Supreme Court as a violation of the uh, interestingly enough of the uh, of the Fourteenth Amendment and the Interstate Commerce uh, Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, uh, the the argument was was that uh, when states regulated trust, they were uh, regulating what was in essence interstate commerce, and they can't do that. Uh, so, uh, and it was also referred to as an infringement on. Uh, an infringement on trade. So uh, also the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was designed to uh, kind of curtail the trust, was also being used against unions uh, you know, to curtail the, the ability of the union. So if progressives re really wanted to have a, a, a you know, a, uh, a goal, have a have an impact. They had to do it at the national level. Even something like temperance. Uh, what good was a uh, was uh, making it illegal to buy alcohol in say Massachusetts? Just making it up off the top of my head. I don't believe it was. A, 
illegal in Massachusetts. Um, but it, making it illegal in Massachusetts, if you could just go to Connecticut and buy alcohol and then come back into Massachusetts, it, it becomes a real pro problem. So we need to have, to have a national profile here. Um, and also, the progressives were making a huge splash. They were especially making a huge splash, uh, splash in the Republican Party, interestingly enough. Um, and also, they were making a lot of inroads into the Democratic Party. So uh, during this time, of course, uh, we can't see one particular political party as being the progressive party, whereas the other party was not. Uh, there were progressive Republicans and there were progressive Democrats. Of course, the Democratic Party had already largely embraced the populist platform, and as you saw last class, there's a, there's a significant overlap between the populist platform and, uh, and what the progressives wanted to accomplish. So, um, so of course, some progr uh, many progressives are going to start making inroads into the Democratic Party. But interestingly enough, there were a lot of progressives in the, in the Republican Party as well, uh, and they were a huge influence uh, on, on politics. And, and what was happening is, as, um, as state-level reforms were being put into effect, those state leaders, like Robert La Follette, uh, who was instrumental in reshaping progressive reforms in Wisconsin, eventually get elected to national office. They become national senators and, and representatives, again, like, like uh, La Follette. And, of course, they end up with national aspirations, so we start to get a, a national imprint. But also, we got to remember that the Republican Party, for instance, uh, what, and the Democratic Party were not in and of themselves necessarily progressively uh, liberal Institutions. Uh, these were institutions that are that are you know kind of somewhat conservative, and the conservatives in those parties would don't want to see the progressives uh, taking over. And at this point, American liberalism is starting to shift. I mean, the old guard liberalism of of expansionism and uh, and free market policies is now well that won. Uh, so that's kind of becoming the conservative idea. And now a new brand of liberalism is starting to emerge in the late 19th century, starting with the populace and, and culminating in the progressives. So these more, these new liberal, progressive liberal uh, thinkers are starting to influence their own party politics. It's becoming a, quite an issue, and there's a lot of infighting going on within these parties, which turns out to actually be an opportunity for progressive um, activists to push their agenda on the national level. You can start playing these um, these uh, rival houses within the political parties against each other and kind of get yourself a, a stage going here. So um, so that's kind of the setup of what's going on. We, of course, we have to uh, start this off with uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. Now, uh, Theodore Roosevelt will become president quite by accident. Of course, he becomes, uh, he becomes hugely popular as a result of the Spanish-American War, which we'll talk about later on, and, um, and he will get himself elected to, uh, to the governorship in New York. And, and as governor, he became kind of a problematic figure for the Republican Party. He was a Republican, and he became kind of a problematic figure because he was starting to embrace a lot of this reform politics was, that was starting to kick around um, in New York during this time. Time period, and uh, so one of the he was kind of a loud, belligerent guy. So uh, one of the things that the party machine decided to do in New York was, was kick him upstairs. Uh, in essence, they they decided to put him on the ticket, uh, you know, the 1900 presidential ticket, uh, running as William McKinley's uh, vice presidential, uh, you know, nominee. And uh, the idea was, well, M William McKinley was a very established president at this point, very successful president at this point, and he had a pretty firm grip over uh, Republican politics national politics, and really what does a vice president do? Eh, he cuts some ribbons, he presides over the Senate every once in a while, uh, it's really not that big a deal, and you don't have much of a voice as a vice president. Um, so they figured they would kick him upstairs where he could be, uh, you know, firmly controlled by uh, President McKinley, a relatively strong president. Well, unfortunately uh, for the Republican Party, and you know, let's face it, unfortunately for William McKinley, uh, William McKinley does not, he, he wins re-election, but he does not survive very long into his, uh, into his first year of his second term of office. He will be assassinated by an anarchist, uh, you know, by, by the name of Shogoltz, and, um, and he'll, he'll die. He'll hold on for about a week or so, and then he'll kick off. He'll die. And this leaves Teddy Roosevelt as president for almost a full term. Um, you know, unele relatively unelected as, as presidents go. So, uh, and he starts off. He starts off pretty well with a bang. Um, his, uh, his policy was something that he referred to as the new nationalism. In other words, uh, Teddy Roosevelt believed that, um, 
that he, he could use the power of the federal government to kind of level the playing field for the little guy, uh, to make it uh, a, make markets a little bit more fair. He believed that trusts were restricting capitalism and that they were a restriction on fair trade and fair market practices. So he wanted to use the power of the federal government to kind of level the playing field, uh, so to speak. Uh, and this was his idea of the new nationalism. Well, his new nationalism also had imperialist uh, ambitions as well. I'm going to talk about all of these presidents that we're talking about now, again later on when we talk about American imperialism. But right now we're going to talk about the progressive movement. Um, and, um, and Theodore Roosevelt is going to just jump right into it. One of, his, uh, one of the tricks he has up his sleeve is to actually use the Sherman Antitrust Act, surprise, surprise, for what the Sherman Antitrust Act was designed for, to take down trusts that were inhibiting trade. Uh, and he starts off right off the bat going after uh, the, um, the Northern Securities Company. Uh, this was a securities company owned by J.P. Morgan. I mean, the J.P. Morgan. The J.P. Morgan. Morgan. Um, and um, he went after J.P. Morgan uh, goes over to the White House and says, hey, look, whatever we did, sorry, we won't do it again. Uh, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt is like, mm -mm, we're going to get rid of your trust right now. And he dissolved the, uh, the Northern Securities Trust. Um, and he did this to another, uh, a number of other trusts. So um, now, uh, now some trust busting was basically going in and breaking up these trusts and, and kind of dissolving them and forcing them to, uh, to, to develop into other other businesses, smaller businesses. Now, um, now Teddy Roosevelt was known as the trust buster, and he did, in fact, bust quite a few trusts, namely the uh, the Northern Securities Company, but other trusts he, he kind of liked. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt recognized it as part of his new nationalism that there were some trusts that were actually worthwhile, and if those trusts weren't inhibiting trade, then there was no reason to, to bust them up. He wasn't going to go after all trusts. Um, and, in fact, one of the trusts that he kind of liked was U.S. Steel. He kind of had U.S. Steel, and he kept uh, the, the threat of trust busting open, um, but he was able to regulate, largely regulate what was going on in U.S. Steel, and, and U.S. Steel, of course, didn't want to step out, out of line too much for fear that their trust would be busted up. So he was able to kind of regulate the trust, but just by using the fear of, uh, of trust busting, and, um, but he didn't do that to all of these busts. Uh, in 1902, he, this, uh, the, the coal miner strike in 1902 was an excellent example of Teddy Roosevelt's um, strengths and limits as a progressive, or what we would call a progressive president. In 1902, uh, there was a huge coal mining strike. There was a, this coal mining strike uh, was uh, against the Reading Railroad that that uh, that owned these coal mines, and. Um, and uh, after a couple months, he realized, hey, this is not really good for business, so he intervened. He, he brought in the leaders of the, uh, of the coal miners' union, and he brought in the, uh, the leaders of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the coal mines, the owners of the coal mines, and um, he sat them down. And, of course, the, uh, the owners were thinking, yeah, here we go, this is pretty good. The president's calling us in, and the president's basically going to smack down the unions like they always do. The president's going to say, hey, look, if, uh, if you guys don't stop your strike, we're going to move in with federal troops, and we're going we're to you know, uh, bring in scab labor, and, and we're going to enforce it. Well, that's not what Teddy Roosevelt did. In fact, he was, kind of became somewhat irate with the, uh, with the coal mine uh, uh, owners. And, uh, and Teddy Roosevelt uh, ended up siding largely with the coal miners. And, he said, and instead of saying, I'm going to use my federal troops to, um, to break your strike, instead what he said is, I'm going to use federal troops to take over your coal mines and nationalize those coal mines, uh, which the owners just kind of were appalled at this. Well, okay, well, what do you want us to do? Uh, so Teddy Roosevelt said, all right, uh, the coal miners are looking for a 20% increase in wages and an eight-hour workday. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to compromise, and you're going to give them a 10% raise and, uh, and a nine-hour workday. And, uh, but... Uh, now, and, and, of course, the, the owners agreed, and the, and the strike was over. Now, one of the things that the coal miners were looking for was recognition of their union. Remember, at this time, uh, unions were not legally recognized institutions. Um, Teddy Roosevelt would not go that far. Uh, so there were limits to his uh, his progressivism in this case. So um, the Hepburn Act was another one. Uh, he uh, he found himself having a hard time regulating things through the Interstate Commerce Commission that had been established earlier. Um, so what he did, what he... Uh, what he helped push and support it, of course, this has to go through Congress. Uh, the Hepburn Act was signed through Congress and was promoted by uh, uh, a new breed of, uh, of uh, progressive uh, Republicans and populist Democrats in, in Congress. This Hepburn Act strengthened the Interstate Commerce Commission and gave them the ability to enforce uh, interstate commerce laws. Um, 
Let's see, the Pure Food and Drug Act is something we, we still have around today, the Food and Drug, uh, and the, the idea of the pure, of pure Food and Drug Act was that it was going to be the federal government was going to go in and uh, make sure and inspect and make sure that uh, the foods you eat really were the foods that you ate and the medicines that you took really did actually do the things that medicines take. Uh, do. When you go to the drugstore and you buy a medicine, you have a pretty good idea that you, you, you're pretty secure that, that this medicine's probably going to work. Um, because it's regulated by the food, uh, Pure Food and Drug Act. Uh, also, the Meat Inspection Act was uh, was something else. Uh, this was uh, this was a uh, baby that came from Upton Sinclair's uh, The Jungle. Remember, we talked about the, the Jungle last week or last uh, last lecture, in which uh, you know his expose uh, in that novel uh, showed what what meat packing was like, and people got appalled and they said, "Hey, I, I need to make sure that when I buy a thing of beef, that I'm actually getting beef and I'm not getting rat meat or whatever." So uh, um, so the, the Meat Inspection Act was put into effect in which government officials were going to go around and actually inspect the meat, uh, the meat packers. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was a, a big believer in conservation. He wasn't necessarily a big be believer in conservation for, uh, for the kind of tree hugger reasons like uh, John Muir, the great, uh, the great environmentalist uh, in the turn of the 20th century was, although there's a great picture of, uh, of Teddy Roosevelt with John Muir um, at the Grand Canyon. But... Um, but he believed in conservation for the sake of uh, preserving the legacy and kind of giving an opportunity for manly activity uh, in the great outdoors. Teddy Roosevelt was very much into that kind of machismo. And um, so conservation, he is going to be responsible for putting aside and, and setting aside uh, five national parks, uh, 60 national monuments. I believe it was something like 53 uh, wildlife preserves, especially he liked to hunt. So that was, a, you know, we were going to preserve these animals so we can kill them. And um, but but either way, this is this was if you're into conservation, this was definitely a step in the right direction. Um, uh, so Teddy Roosevelt was very much, very heavily involved in this, and uh, toward that end, he's also going to institute the, a public lands commission to go and make sure that all publicly owned lands, national parks and national forests and things like that, they are all owned by you and me. That's why we can go to them and enjoy them, and we don't have to worry about being kicked off for trespassing. Uh, those are lands that, that belong to us, the American public. Um, and he put those into effect. Now, um, now during his time, in 1904, he runs for re-election. Um, well, not re-election, he just runs for elected. He wasn't originally elected, right? In 1904, he runs for election, and uh, he, he runs under what is called the Square Deal. So the Square Deal was basically his campaign platform. Uh, and the idea was that this was a way of describing to the American people what his, national, what his new nationalism was all about, the Square Deal, that all working people were going to get a, a quote-unquote square deal. Squares, of course, have equal sides. It's about equality. There you go. Um, and, uh, but, of course, uh, toward the end of his, uh, his presidency, there is going to be a panic, uh, a, a economic crisis in 1907. Um, this economic crisis had nothing to do with his progressivism. It had to do with, a, with a, uh, um, you know, some bad invest some investments that went bad and then a run on the banks. And this became a huge, huge problem. It was actually really, really bad. Um, and, in fact, uh, what ended up saving the uh, the economy was J P J P Morgan uh, and a number of other investors related to J P Morgan making loans to banks to keep them afloat um, and to keep the American economy going. So this this kind of showed that there was a weakness in the American economy and it re and it made people realize, hey, we need to reform our banking and that's going to become an, an issue in just a moment. Uh, but Teddy Roosevelt. By 1907, because of this, uh, because of this banking crisis, and uh, which kind of rattled uh, the old, what we would call the old guard Republicans, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, Remember, the, the, there was a, a, a good knot of progressives in the Republican Party, but they didn't control the Republican Party. And a lot of these Republicans uh, were, were kind of getting upset with Roosevelt and a lot of the progressive uh, ideas that he was putting through. Um, and also, Teddy Roosevelt had promised uh, that in 1904 that he would not run for a what would amount to a third term in office. He already served almost a full term uh, with, by finishing McKinley's term, and then he, he uh, went through a second term in office, and it was a fear that he would actually get a third term because he could technically run for re-election. Um, and he promised that he wouldn't do that. So what, he, what happened is in 19, 1908, Teddy Roosevelt decides, you know what, I'm not going to run for office. You know, I'm going to uh, go off and uh, I'm going to go to Africa and kill some animals, and, uh, and I'll be perfectly happy. But, uh, so um, in 1908... He, uh, he finds 
a fellow by the, his secretary of war, a fellow by the name of William Howard Taft, um, and he decides that Taft is his man. Taft is the guy who's going to take over um, Roosevelt's position, and he is going to um, he's going to uh, you know help institute more of these progressive reforms. So he uh, so Roosevelt gives Taft his backing. Uh, Taft runs against William Jennings Bryan, uh, and he wins in 1908. Um, and that's how, uh, how William Howard Taft became president. He had relatively little political experience. He had been a judge. Uh, he, had, he was Secretary of War. That was about the extent of it. Uh, so that what got him really elected was uh, Roosevelt's, um, you know, Roosevelt's uh, uh, backing. And then, of course, Roosevelt went off to Africa to shoot some rhinos. Um, now, unfortunately for William Howard Taft, and actually, unfortunately for Roosevelt, William Howard Taft wasn't particularly progressive. Um, he, he was under a lot of progressive influence, of course, um, and there was, a, there was a huge, a growing progressive following uh, during this time, but he himself was not particularly progressive. Um, so there are a couple of conflicts that he does end up having with with the progressives within the Republican Party. Uh, first of all, was was, was the was the Payne Aldrich tariff. Um, the Payne Aldrich tariff. I should probably write that in. It's Payne with a Y Aldrich. Progressives didn't like tariffs. Tariffs kept uh, prices high, uh, and it was bad for consumers. It was a, it was a, a drain on consumers. So progressives at this time uh, liked the idea of lower uh, tariffs and, and bringing tariffs down. So Taft, of course, said, said, "Hey, yeah, I'll bring the tariffs down." And then um, what he ended up signing was this thing called the Payne Aldrich tariff. And the Payne Aldrich tariff. Uh, really didn't do much. Uh, you know, it did bring down some tariffs on things like canary seed. I I'm not kidding. Canary seed uh, and some other minor things. But for the most things, the most products that, uh, that Americans really wanted and needed, uh, the tariff remained relatively high. Uh, and uh, Taft tried to sell this by saying, hey, this is the best thing ever. Hey, paying Aldrich tariff, and nobody was buying it. Uh, the progressives in the Republican Party became very, very furious with him. Uh, I, you know, and then uh, they, they kind of contact Roosevelt. Roosevelt's like, what? I, you know, i got to give up my rhino shooting for this? And he goes, he, you know, so, Roosevelt starts to head back home. And um, so the Payne Aldrich tariff was a real problem. And also, uh, another problem uh, happened as a result of what was called the uh, Bellinger Pinchot. Bellinger Pinchot scandal. Oops, Pinchot uh, scandal. And this was a scandal that had to do with uh, Teddy Roosevelt's beloved conservationism. Uh, in that, um, you know, uh, uh, Pinchot was, uh, was the leader of the National Forest Service, and he discovered that Bellinger, who was the Secretary of the Interior, was uh, opening up uh, public lands to private consumers, uh, to private enterprise. Uh, and these were lands in Alaska uh, that they found some coal on, and coal mining companies wanted to go in there and, uh, and mine that coal. And Bellinger was saying, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. Let's open these lands up. And uh, so Pinchot, uh, you know, went to William Howard Taft and said, hey, dude, you know, we're, we're opening up these public lands to, to private enterprise, and we're not, it's not costing it, you know, they, they're not paying for it. Uh, and Taft ended up siding with Bellinger. He actually thought it was a pretty good idea. Uh, and so Pinchot went public. He went to the newspapers, and of course, uh, the conservation movement was a very popular movement at the time, and uh, people were very upset with the idea that their lands were being used for private purposes. And this became a huge scandal, and uh, further infuriating uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, um, there was, this was also kind of a, a conflict between what we would call the old guard in, in the Republican Party, the old uh, pro-business, um, you know, uh, protectionist uh, part of the Republican Party, uh, pro-banker, pro-corporation, pro-trust, uh, you know, wing of the Republican Party was your old guard versus your new progressive Republicans such as Robert La Follette. Um, and this, so this conflict between Taft and La Follette and uh, the old guard represented by Taft and the, uh, and the new guard or the progressives represented by La Follette. And, of course, Teddy Roosevelt, who was the leader of the progressive movement in the Republican Party and probably the leader of the progressive movement in the United States, it's fair to say. Now, that's not to say that Taft himself 
um, was totally not progressive. He did support the 16th Amendment, which provided for an income tax, uh, a graduated income tax. He, uh, he was a supporter of industrial safety codes, uh, which was something that a lot of uh, industrialists didn't want to have to pay for uh, using safety implements. Uh, he, was, um, he instituted a children's bureau to study children's issues in the United States. Um, he put to, he put into effect a Bureau of Mines to oversee mining safety and, and health concerns, and um, he signed the Mann Act, which went through Congress. The Mann Act is something that we wouldn't kind of see as progressive today, but was very progressive in the uh, early uh, early 20th century. This was a law that prohibited the transport of women across state lines for immoral purposes, and by immoral purposes, of course, we mean sex. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, William Howard Taft actually. Uh, instituted, uh, started more uh, trust busting uh, than actually Teddy Roosevelt did. He went after more trusts than uh, than than the trust buster did. Uh, and in fact, this is actually going to get him, ironically, into trouble, more trouble with Teddy Roosevelt. One of the trusts that. Um, that uh, Taft went after. Well, he went after Standard Oil uh, and broke up the Standard Oil Trust. Uh, so now that we have now we have Exxon and uh, and Sunoco and, and uh, Texaco and all these. Well, they, those all used to be uh, Standard Oil. But one of the trusts that he actually went over after was U.S. Steel, and that was a trust that Roosevelt liked and wanted to hold together and keep together, and uh, he ended up going after it. That even infuriates Roosevelt even more, which is kind of ironic, because we believe we we see the. Um, uh, the uh, conflict between Roosevelt and Taft as being between progressivism and old guard uh, republicanism. But in this case, it actually was that Taft was more progressive uh, in some ways than Roosevelt was, at least as far as U.S. Steel was concerned. Well, either way, um, this split between uh, Roosevelt and Taft and uh, manifest in a split between the progressive Republicans and the old guard Republicans, and it resulted in uh, a really, really crucial election called the election of 1912. And what ended up happening was Roosevelt comes back and, and by his own saying, threw his hat in the ring to run for president. Uh, he said, you know what, I promise not to, to run again, but that, that only meant conservative ter uh, con consecutive terms. So I'm going to run again now. It's non-consecutive, so it's a start over. Really, that's what it is. Uh, he throws his hat in the, in the ring, and he tries to get himself nominated as the Republican nominee for president and undercut Taft. However, Taft w had um, kind of given in to a lot of the old guard Republicans, and the old guard Republicans would much rather have Taft than they would have Ro uh, Roosevelt. Uh, so they, uh, so in the nomination process for determining who the candidate was going to be, uh, the Republican Party turned against Roosevelt. Well, Roosevelt ran out. And he immediately signed up for this new uh, political party called the Progressive Party that was led by Robert La Follette. And when he went into the Progressive Party, he was again he was a pretty uh, you know powerful guy. He ended up undercutting uh, Robert La Follette uh, and uh, taking control of the Progressive Party and running for president uh, under the on the Progressive Party ticket. Um, so um, so what that did was it split the Republican vote. Um, so we ended up with this, this really interesting election here. Uh, and take a look down here and see uh, what we got going on. Um, this is the, uh, this is the, these are the candidates. Now, now take a look at this. So there's, there's Teddy Roosevelt running as a progressive, and there's Taft running on the Republican ticket. And we also see, interestingly enough, um, uh, socialist candidate Eugene V. Debs, who we talked about before. Um, and he's running, and he's actually making a pretty good show of it. And ultimately, we have uh, running as the Democrat uh, was Woodrow Wilson. Now, Woodrow Wilson uh, was selected by the Democrats largely uh, as a result of trying to kind of tamp down. You know, William Jennings Bryan had just lost another election for president, so this kind of this kind of was a shot in the stomach for the populist Democrats. Uh, so Woodrow Wilson was kind of presented as an alternative to Bryanism. He was a more conservative, he was a Southerner, uh, tended to be a little, lot more conservative, so the Democrats put him up uh, as their nominee and, and ran him. Now, it's, it's really fascinating to take a look now, uh, when you take a look at the socialist candidate, of course, uh, Debs, he's actually going to pull... 
almost a million votes in this election when you think about this. So this is, this is he has 6% of the electorate uh, is voting socialist. So this is a little bit scary as well for a lot of, uh, a lot of the power elite. Whoa, we don't want, don't, we don't want socialists involved here. So, um, but anyway, this uh, split in the Republican Party um, with, the, with, with the Republicans and the Progressive Party, uh, which was the... Um, which, which was the progressive, which was the political manifestation of the progressives, of the progressive movement, um, well, that is going to split the vote. Now, as you can kind of see, um, Taft, uh, you know, T uh, Taft gets 8% of the, uh, of the uh, electoral vote, but take a look at the, um, I mean, it wasn't really even close overall for the electoral vote, but take a look at the popular vote. Um, Roosevelt and Taft together, get about 7.5, 7.6 uh, million votes compared to Wilson's 6 million votes. So Woodrow Wilson wins the election of 1912, but he only wins the election of 1912 with 41%, 42% of the vote. So Woodrow Wilson wins as a minority president. More people voted for somebody other than Wilson um, than actually voted for Wilson. But either way, Woodrow Wilson is going to win. Now, Woodrow Wilson's a fasc pretty fascinating guy. Uh, very little, relatively little political experience. Uh, he kind of pushed himself up into the, uh, into the presidential position. Um, he's the first Democrat uh, to win a presidential election since 1892. He will be the last Democrat to win a uh, uh, to win the presidential uh, to the presidency until 1932, uh, when Franklin Roosevelt does it, um, he is a, our, our best educated president. He was a PhD, a president of uh, of Princeton University, um, and a you know pretty brainy guy. He was also known as an idealist, as, a, as somebody who was going to follow his moral uh, virtues, and it, it sure does look like he did just that. Um, his position was the idea of the new freedom. Hey, you know what we need to do is we need to go in there and we need to, to not so much bust up the, tr uh, the trusts, but we want to go in and we want to, you know, kind of regulate the trusts and kind of maybe break them down into smaller units and then stand back and let capitalism take its course. He was not uh, a particularly radical uh, socialist progressive in this case. So, um, so that's what he wanted to do. So he, his, his slogan was the new freedom. And uh, Woodrow Wilson believed that there were three walls of privilege. He, he referred to them as three walls of privilege uh, that were holding back, that uh, was holding back the United States from really developing into a, an economic powerhouse that it could be. Um, first was the tariff. Yeah, according to Wilson, the tariff had to come down, uh, which was not a, an uncommon um, democratic idea. It was also a progressive idea. Um, the banks. The banks needed to be reformed, according to, uh, to Wilson, which was obvious as a result of the, uh, the Panic of 1907. And he also felt that trusts had to be reformed, that trusts had to be regulated and toned down a bit. But he did not want to quite go into that as forcefully as Roosevelt and Taft did. So uh, this, these were his, uh, his triple wall of privilege. Um, now, Wilson also has an issue. He realizes that he's a minority president. And... Um, and if he, he's got to think about being reelected in 1916. So in order to, to uh, get reelected in 1916, he himself was relatively personally conservative, but he realized that the progressive element, uh, the progressive element in the country was actually really, really strong. And it was a really strong factor for the Republicans. Um, and he, he, so he realized that even though he didn't necessarily always agree with the progressives, he needed to uh, at least uh, pander to the progressives a little bit if he was going, if he, if there was any chance that he was going to be elected in, um, in re-elected in 1916. Uh, one of the things he does instantly is what's called the Underwood Simmons tariff, which drastically reduces the the, the tariff rates on, on most goods, um, in major goods, uh, to bring the tariff down from 40 percent all the way down to like 25 percent. It was a huge huge cut, uh, which was a huge benefit to, uh, to consumers. Um, also under Taft, uh, the, uh, the 16th Amendment had been, um, 
had been ratified. Uh, it, it, its final ratification was under Wilson, but most of the work was done under Taft. Um, but under Wilson, he's, the 16th Amendment allows Congress to, uh, to create an income tax, but it doesn't actually create the income tax. Congress ultimately does, under the 16th Amendment, create an income tax, which is, the, which is a good thing because he needed to make up for lost revenue from reducing the tariff, which was the major source of federal revenue. Now we're going to implement the, uh, the income tax. And the income tax is largely going to be uh, a tax on income of the wealthiest Americans. Um, uh, it, he institutes the F uh, Federal Trade Commission to uh, to oversee uh, trade, especially trade going on uh, among the trust. The idea was to kind of go in there and, um, you know, uh, research and take a look at what the trusts were doing and then kind of go to them and say, hey, look, you guys are getting, you guys are restricting trade and here's how you're doing it. Here's what we can do about it. And, um, and the, so that was the goal. Also under um, Wilson is the highly controversial Clayton Antitrust Act. Um, now many progressives uh, saw the Clayton Antitrust Act as a betrayal because it actually the Clayton Antitrust Act actually weakens uh, the federal government's ability to uh, to bust up and break up these trusts. Remember, Wilson was more uh, interested in regulating the trusts and getting them to kind of self-correct than anything else. Um, however, the Clayton Antitrust Act did uh, make it illegal for um, for uh, you know companies to to use the Sherman Antitrust Act to go after unions, um, and to also uh, uh, you know to go after farmers and and, not, and agricultural interests. So there was that that particular benefit. And the Clayton Antitrust Act is is still pretty much the Antitrust Act that we we would follow today. Um, he uh, nominated the great uh, progressive jurist Louis Brandeis to the uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, the Kern McGillicuddy Act. The, the Kern McGillicuddy Act um, is going to establish workmen's compensation for for um, for workers that are that are involved in interstate commerce. Uh, the Keating uh, Owen Act is going to be an act restricting child labor. If you are under 14 years old, you are no longer going to be allowed to work in industries that are involved in interstate commerce. Um, and the Adamson Act, which um, reduced the hours for railroad workers to eight hours a day. Now these um, these three acts um, really only apply to uh, businesses involved in interstate commerce and federal, uh, you know, federally regulated businesses. So it really only impacted maybe about ten percent of the labor force, but it was a huge start. And it's the first time really that the federal government is going to uh, insinuate itself into uh, into economics like that, into into businesses in quite that way. Um, also, under Woodrow Wilson, we see an unprecedented surge in, in the number of uh, constitutional amendments. Uh, of course, the 16th Amendment was ratified under, uh, was finalized under him. This, uh, this allowed for an income tax. The 17th Amendment allowed for the popular election of, uh, of senators. That was something that the populists had been fighting for. The progressives picked up that particular banner, and they ran with it, and now it's a constitutional amendment. When you vote, uh, you will get an opportunity to vote for your senators because of the 17th Amendment. Uh, the 18th Amendment will make the sale of alcohol illegal uh, in the United States. Uh, this, was a progressive, this was a progressive amendment in that the temperance movement was one of the progressive movements. Um, and then finally, the 19th Amendment will be ratified under Woodrow Wilson, and this amendment is going to extend the vote to women. Um, so this was this was a huge. These were huge progressive uh, amendments that were added to the uh, to the Constitution under Woodrow Wilson. This was this was gigantic. Um, I want to talk about another act that came under um, uh, under uh, uh, Wilson, but it's a little bit more complicated. I want us to spend a little bit more time on it. It's also extremely extremely important. It's one of the the least understood things among students, and it is such a huge huge part of your everyday lives. Um, and it's called the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 that was signed by Wilson. Uh, this was a result of the uh, banking crisis of 1907. People started to work on ways of, of reforming banking. A lot of the banks said, hey, why don't we have a national bank? Again, just like back in the old days, well, the progressives were like, yeah, we, we don't really want to do the whole national bank thing. All right, so let's break it up and, do, uh, and, uh, and create a board of state banks. Uh, again, that's kind of national bankish. So what these guys did is they came up with a compromise. And they, what they, this compromise was was the, was the Federal Reserve System, which is the system that we still have today. Um, and what this did was it divided the country up into 12 banking regions um, and, uh, and set 
uh, these regions, the kind of the center of these regions at these major cities. Like for me, uh, living in Florida, my Federal Reserve is, uh, bank is, is located out of, uh, out of Atlanta. So these are 12 regional banks. And these 12 regional banks, these are private banks, these are privately owned banks, they are not government banks, it's not a national bank. Um, and um, and then there was there will be a Federal Reserve Board, and the Federal Reserve Board will be appointed by the president and, and nominated. And so these would be government uh, government overseers of these national banks. And the Federal Reserve Board would consist of these uh, these board members that are appointed by the president, as well as the presidents of each of these regional banks. Um, and each of these banks, each of these member banks, these Federal Reserve banks, will be required to give uh, a, a certain percentage of their reserves uh, over to the Federal Reserve and hold and simply hold them in reserve. Uh, so if you're if you're a Federal Reserve bank, then you have got to uh, reserve a certain amount of money that is in your bank. Um, and so here's how this is going to work. Now, if you take a look. Um, for instance, at, at a dollar bill. If you take a dollar bill out of your pocket right now, uh, you can take a look and you will see uh, on the top of your dollar bill, here it says Federal Reserve Note. Okay, It does not say United States um, uh, a note, it says, or U.S. Treasury Note, it says a Federal Reserve Note. So th this is money that is owned by the Federal Reserve Bank. Oh my God, it's the Illuminati. It's a no. It's a, the, all those conspiracy theories. You just kind of backwash, it, back wipe, and, and 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 call it a day. They're not all that good. It was, it was, it, this is money that is coined by the Federal Reserve, but that wasn't an uncommon thing. Banks oftentimes coin their own paper money, uh, but now the Federal Reserve is going to be empowered to to uh, to print its own money, and in doing this, uh, they're going to. So part of the part of the uh, function of the Federal Reserve is to print this money and to issue paper money to make it easier to um, you know perform. Uh, you know, financial transactions, but also the Federal Reserve can regulate the amount of money that is in circulation. They do this by um, they do this by raising the reserve requirement. Uh, so the the amount of money that that banks are uh, are required to have on reserve, they can raise that. If if inflation is getting too high, they raise the reserve requirement, and this keeps uh, and this pulls money out of the marketplace. Um, the um, the Federal Reserve will also loan money to member banks that those banks could then loan to other, uh, to you know, business people or people who want to get mortgages and things like that. And so that means that the Federal Reserve can also raise its interest rates on the money that it loans to, uh, to member banks. And, um, and that means that those banks are going to have to raise their interest rates when they loan out to businesses and to, uh, and to, uh, to private to private people, uh, and this discourages people from taking out loans. So again, if inflation gets too high, the Federal Reserve simply can raise its reserve requirements, and they can raise the interest rates that they that they uh, offer on the on the money that they loan, and this will reduce the amount of uh, of money in the market. And consequently, if you're going through a deflationary period, the bank can lower its reserve requirements and lower its interest rates and get more money into the marketplace and um, and, and kind of encourage uh, investment. So this is how the Federal Reserve Act, uh, Federal Reserve works. It's really not all that big and scary a thing, although it's oftentimes portrayed that way if you like to, to watch the, uh, uh, get your news from YouTube, so to speak. Now, uh, one of the um, biggest pieces of evidence here for uh, the success of the progressive era uh, you know, if we take a look at progressivism as the um, as as the federal government uh, taking responsibility for uh, for these areas of our lives, is to take a look at well, how many people actually work for the federal government between 1890 and um, and 1915? What do we see? We see almost a quadrupling of the uh, of the number of people who are now working for the federal government in all of these regulated regulatory bodies. Um, that's a really good example. Now, uh, but the progressive era is not going to survive uh, indefinitely. Although the progressive, uh, there's still a progressive movement today, um, but um, but the progressive era is going to come to an end quite abruptly. As a matter of fact, uh, ironically, by Woodrow Wilson, uh, when Woodrow Wilson declares uh, war against Germany and brings the United States into World War One, uh, he will then pretty much put the kibosh on any further uh, progressive, uh, you know, progressive. Uh, um, you know, reforms. Uh, the uh, the country will turn toward um, 
all of its efforts will then go into fighting this particular war. Uh, and that'll be the end of the progressive era. And once the war ends, uh, there'll be kind of a, a conservative backslide in the 1920s politically, uh, in which uh, there, there's very little uh, uh, political momentum to, uh, to, con to continue with these progressive reforms. So uh, the, the progressive era comes to an end as a result of World War I. And that's it. I mean, so, uh, so this, these two lectures should give you a pretty good idea in a nutshell of the, uh, of the expanse of the progressive movement. Uh, next time we'll be talking about imperialism and a whole different way of, uh, of looking at, uh, at um, government and, uh, and what government does with regard to foreign policy. So there you go.